on this Friday night, troublesome trajectory. We may be experiencing a bit of turbulence. The cases of COVID-19 on the rise in Canada and the timeline for getting kids vaccinated. Britain sends military reinforcements to Poland over the migrant crisis. The situation at the border is desperate and it's getting worse by the day. From police officer to prisoner, the case of a Canadian constable that has led to a review of policing in Newfoundland and Labrador, and Canada's soccer goals, the excitement kicking up over the World Cup qualifier. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Just when Canada was making strides with vaccinations, the number of COVID-19 cases is back on the rise. Ontario is reporting the highest jump with just under 600 new cases. That province has seen a steady increase in the past two weeks. So far, hospitalizations are staying steady in Ontario, but in Manitoba, it's a more worrying picture. In the last week, COVID-19 hospital admissions were up 23%, and the number of ICU patients has increased by 25%. They mostly involve unvaccinated people, and today the vaccine drive got another boost. Health Canada has approved Moderna's application for a booster shot. As Abigail Beeman reports in our top story tonight, there is also promising news for parents. It looks like we may be experiencing a bit of turbulence this week. Case counts up by 11%. The country's top doctor points to cooler weather bringing people indoors, plus loosening restrictions. COVID-19 particles disperse much faster when we let fresh air into the room. On airborne transmission, Theresa Tam seems to be following the UK's lead. They released this video encouraging people to open the window even briefly when gathering for the holidays. We've learned how the virus can linger in fine aerosols and remain suspended in the air we breathe much as expelled smoke lingers. The scientific data is now really quite clear that there is airborne transmission or aerosol transmission of COVID-19. What's open to debate is what proportion of transmission is due to that route. Many parents are frustrated American kids have been getting vaccinated for two weeks, while Pfizer's pediatric vaccine hasn't been approved by Health Canada. The review is actively ongoing and we expect to have a, a final decision in the next one to two weeks. Pfizer gave data to the FDA before Health Canada. Let's be happy they're not rushing it. They only got this data last month, mid last month, so they are moving at a good space. They're pretty brisk. And in the meantime, experts recommend layering protections. Why, for heaven's sake, can't people wear their masks? And why need people use a Coke or a popcorn as an excuse not to wear their masks? I simply am at a loss. New modeling from Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table shows cases are rising. They project ICU occupancy to increase, though hospitalizations are currently stable. Concluding the province's reopening pause on high-risk settings like nightclubs was wise. If you see acceleration, don't step on the gas pedal. Another outstanding question, the requirement for a negative COVID test to enter Canada. Friday, the Conservatives called to match the U.S., drop the PCR requirement for land entry, and give an option for a rapid antigen test if entering by air. For the second week in a row, Dr. Tam would only say those requirements are under review. Robin? Abigail Beeman in Ottawa. Thanks, Abigail. Europe is once again the global epicenter of the pandemic, reporting the highest number of new cases and deaths since April 2020, when the virus first swept through Italy. The continent now accounts for more than half of the weekly infections worldwide. In the last seven days, that number was more than 2 million. And in the last week, Europe reported more than half the global deaths, with more than 28,000. That has prompted some European governments to impose partial lockdowns, including the Netherlands. Starting Saturday for three weeks, bars and restaurants will close early and sporting events will be held without spectators. Residents won't be allowed to invite more than four guests into their homes. And social distancing rules will be reinstated. The lockdown measures are the first in Western Europe since the summer. New infections topped 16,000 for a second day in a row in the Netherlands, despite 85% of adults being fully vaccinated. And in a rare move, Austria is set to place millions of unvaccinated people in lockdown. The restrictions will affect the two hardest hit regions of Upper Austria and Salzburg. So starting Monday, people in those areas can only leave home for work and to shop for essentials. The government says it's still considering a nationwide lockdown for unvaccinated people. About 65% of the population is fully vaccinated. 
one of the lowest rates in Western Europe. Turning to the migrant crisis in Europe, Britain is now sending in troops to help Poland as tensions escalate on the border with Belarus. The Polish government is caught in the middle of a battle between Belarus and the rest of the European Union. The president of Belarus is being accused of encouraging illegal border crossings to retaliate against EU sanctions. As Mike Jolet reports, the political posturing has created a dangerous stalemate. It's getting cold on the border between Belarus and Poland. You can read it on the foreheads of migrant children. The only thing heating up right now is the political tension. Russia announced it was conducting military exercises with Belarus, leaving Poland to increase its military presence. Now the United Kingdom has stepped in, sending a team of soldiers to help Poland strengthen its borders. Belarus's defense minister has warned Poland not to overestimate its abilities. I want to warn all the hotheads, he said. Belarusian armed forces are ready to fight back harshly on anything. One can hope that it's posturing, that it won't escalate. The problem is that when you have a proximity of military forces, there can be miscalculations. So there is no evidence that there's an intent to escalate this by uh, Russia or NATO, but there is a risk of escalation uh, that is inadvertent. Meanwhile, migrants who believed this was the gateway to a new life in Europe remain stuck behind barbed wire. The European Union has accused Belarus of manufacturing the crisis in retaliation for sanctions imposed on Minsk over human rights abuses. We increasingly hear rhetoric coming out of Brussels like hybrid war. This is not war. These are not weapons. These are people, and they deserve to be treated like people with dignity, respect, and care. At least for now, one key route into Belarus has been shut down. Turkish Airlines, one of the main international airlines flying into Minsk, has agreed to suspend the sale of one-way tickets to people in Syria, Yemen, and Iraq. People are being sold a lie by smugglers. And with no country willing to take in any more refugees, that lie has left Eastern Europe with a humanitarian crisis wrapped in a political stalemate. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Canada's new foreign affairs minister met with her U.S. counterpart today, her first stateside visit since being appointed last month. Melanie Jolie says she pressed U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on two key issues ahead of next week's so-called Three Amigos Summit with Canada, the U.S. and Mexico. Canada is concerned about President Biden's proposed U.S. tax credit for American-built electric vehicles. Ottawa says it would hurt the integrated auto industry and put thousands of jobs at risk. Canadians know that we have to defend our interests and we can't never take anything for granted. So that's my job, to defend Canadians' interests while making sure that we have a very strong friendship relationship with the U.S. Jolie says they also talked about the Enbridge Line 5 pipeline, which is before the courts. The state of Michigan is pushing to close it on environmental grounds. Well, the deadline has come and gone at the COP26 climate summit and negotiators are still trying to hammer out a global accord. The draft agreement calls for a doubling of funds to help poor countries deal with the effects of climate change. But consensus is still needed on the future of fossil fuels and emissions targets. Crystal Gamansing reports from Glasgow on the sticking points. 1.5 is non-negotiable. Our safety, the safety of my children, and yours hangs in the balance. Debating the final details in Glasgow, delegates ran out the clock. We are struggling each year to find money, but $2.5 trillion in the last five years, six years, went into subsidies for fossil fuel. That's a definition of insanity. U.S. climate envoy John Kerry was unequivocal, saying all countries must end fossil fuel subsidies and phase out coal. For the first time in COP history, the draft agreement released Wednesday included such language, but as feared, it was watered down. Frustrated climate activists held a red line demonstration, walking out along with some delegates. The people in there failed us as expected, and I think people just want to show their anger. I've been at this climate fight for a long time. Canada's environment minister says the country already has pledges on the books to end fossil fuel subsidies by 2023. 
We have our work cut out for us to make our commitments a reality. But we are demonstrating a path, a way it can be done by a country that is both a big energy producer and consumer and home to some of the world's largest remaining intact nature. Another sticking point, how much money richer countries will give to developing ones to build up green technologies and cover the cost of damage as a result of climate change. The Philippines, which has seen the effects of a warming planet, noted that developing nations can't repeat the same mistakes of the Industrial Revolution. Greenhouse gas emissions must be cut. The planet has already warmed too much. I think there's a lot of people already suffering now, but the whole of humanity will be suffering dearly if we don't change our uh, behavior. Putting those changes into writing is proving difficult. Negotiations are expected to continue into Saturday, while the young face of the climate movement is back at her post demanding action now. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. The growing civil unrest in Haiti has forced Canada to pull out non-essential staff and their family members from the embassy in Port-au-Prince. Global Affairs Canada says the embassy will stay open to help Canadians still there. Ottawa has already urged Canadian citizens to leave the country if they can safely. Gang violence and kidnappings have been escalating in this small Caribbean country since last month when gangs sealed off the port where fuel is stored. In Newfoundland and Labrador, a judge has sentenced a police officer to four years in prison. Constable Doug Snellgrove was on duty and in uniform when he picked up a woman in his car and then sexually assaulted her at her home. He's a member of the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. Now other women are coming forward to complain about officers in the same department, accusing them of sexual misconduct. Here's Ross Lord. The sentencing judge called Constable Doug Snellgrove's actions reprehensible. While on duty, Snellgrove offered a woman to drive home in his patrol car at 3 a.m., then sexually assaulted her when they got there. In handing down a four-year prison term, the judge suggested the case is extremely rare. The prosecutor agrees. I couldn't locate any similar case when an officer committed sexual assault. While in uniform, no. The woman had spent the evening in the popular downtown district of St. John's. She told the court she awoke to find Snellgrove raping her. She said she's suffered mental anguish and depression ever since. Her ordeal was made even worse by legal errors that led to three trials before Snellgrove was finally convicted, seven years after he raped her. But there's a larger, even more disturbing question. Is Snellgrove just one sexual abuser in a wider pattern of abuse? At first, the police department suggested otherwise. The RNC came out and really had messaging about the fact that this is about a couple of bad apples and we're really not addressing the fact that what they've got is a issue with institutional culture and misogyny within that culture. In fact, 13 other women have made allegations about multiple different constabulary officers committing sexual offenses against them. And it's very telling. They have not come forward to the police, but have come forward to lawyer Lynn Moore. And what we're seeing, um, you know, obviously is that broken trust. Trust that won't be restored by one prison sentence. Criminologists say a six-month independent review of the RNC ordered last month by the provincial government is crucial. It's a matter of assessing also what is the current culture, how has it changed or not changed, and then how can we continue to start making changes moving forward that are going to be useful. The judge said the Snellgrove sentence should send a message to others in positions of authority. The courts will deal appropriately with this type of conduct. I'm satisfied that the judge considered all the factors and, pro and uh, imposed a sentence that is a, a deterrent. Snellgrove has been suspended without pay for six years, until the appeal process is exhausted, he is still a member of the RNC. Ross Lord, Global News, Halifax. Independence Day for Britney Spears. Are you guys ready to free Britney? Coming up, the decision on the conservatorship that's controlled the pop star's life. Plus, former Trump advisor Steve Bannon is in legal trouble. The Free Britney movement was on hand for a termination rally outside an L.A. courthouse this afternoon where a judge granted the pop star her freedom.
The judge ended a conservatorship that held control over the pop star's life and money for nearly 14 years. Spears' father started the arrangement, citing his daughter's mental health and struggles with substance abuse. But in recent years, the 39-year-old called the arrangement abusive and exploitive. Spears credits the Free Britney movement for ending the conservatorship. Now that it's dissolved, there's a plan in place to help Spears transition to life on her own. We have breaking news from Washington. Steve Bannon has been indicted for contempt of Congress. Bannon was once the chief strategist to President Donald Trump. He failed to comply with the subpoena for documents and testimony as part of the investigation into the January 6th siege at the U.S. Capitol building. Bannon is expected to turn himself in on Monday. The indictment could signal trouble for other Trump advisors who've also refused to cooperate with the investigation. Up next, the Indigenous Guardians and their fight against climate change. You're watching Global National. Some important pledges have been made at COP26, but on the front lines of climate change, pledges are just words. There is a group in Canada, though, taking action, combining modern science and ancestral knowledge to protect nature. They're called Indigenous Guardians. Donna Friesen got extraordinary access to see their work on the coast of British Columbia. Stunning and rich with life, the Heltzuk people have lived here for thousands of years, sustained by the bounty of the land and the sea and living in harmony with it. There were many, many villages throughout our whole territory and almost every river system in our territory was uh, utilized by our people. Here, Indigenous Guardians are monitoring the salmon run, walking where their ancestors did. They are the eyes and the ears on the front lines of climate change, and they say it's time the world listened. So we have Guardian watchmen that will come into every salmon system, bearing stream that we have, and see whether or not there's salmon uh, running in those systems to inform whether or not we're comfortable with opening up a commercial fishery or even a food fishery for our people. And it's helping rebuild connections broken by colonialism and residential schools. We did stand on the uh, abyss of uh, near extinction and an annihilation. We are a resilient people. You'll hear some powerful voices talking about the value of Indigenous traditional knowledge and what we can all learn from it in our special report for The New Reality. All right, thanks, Donna. Still ahead, a Canadian soccer star's homecoming sets the stage for a World Cup qualifier. In men's soccer, Canada is emerging as the team to beat. Our national men's team is halfway to qualifying for the World Cup, and the players are on a roll. They've been undefeated in their first six matches. And tonight at Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton, they take on Costa Rica for the first time. As Morgan Black explains, it'll be a special homecoming for one of Canada's biggest soccer stars. Robin, he's played all over the world, but tonight, for the first time in his career, superstar Alfonso Davies is representing Canada in his hometown in front of fans, family and friends. It's expected there's going to be 45,000 people at Commonwealth Stadium tonight. The stadium has not seen a crowd of this size in quite some time. Tonight's match against Costa Rica is one of two crucial World Cup qualifying games being played here in Edmonton. After tonight, the men's team is back Tuesday against Mexico. Canada will be looking to capitalize on home field advantage, and soccer fans here can't wait to watch it all go down. We've seen a lot of excitement with Team Canada in town, and I've seen quite a few people walking around downtown Edmonton decked out in their Team Canada red and white. Alfonso Davies is also excited to be at home. He has been all smiles on the field during practice this week. The 21-year-old's parents will be in the crowd. They haven't watched him play a game since he was a teenager. Now we're known for our love of hockey here, but soccer has become increasingly popular and in part that's because of Davies' star power. He grew up in Edmonton after coming to Canada as a refugee and his impact on the community here has been immense. We stopped by a local soccer academy that trains some of the best young players in Edmonton. Davies still visits their program regularly. He inspires me a lot. I'll watch one of his sprints or something and it'll make me want to go maybe Commonwealth, wherever, just to try that. We're hoping to inspire them. We're hoping to inspire, you know, generations after generation of uh, young footballers in Edmonton and across Canada as well. 
The Canadian men's soccer team hasn't qualified for a World Cup since 1986. Right now they sit third in their group. The top three teams automatically advance to Qatar in 2022. A pair of wins tonight and on Tuesday would put Canada in a great position. Weather-wise, players and fans have struck it lucky for a November night in Edmonton. The temperature is expected to hover around zero. COVID-19 protocols are in place at the stadium. Fans will have to show either proof of vaccine or a negative COVID-19 test to get in. And with 45,000 people attending, fans are encouraged to get here early. Robin? All right, Morgan Black in Edmonton. Thanks, Morgan. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is looking across the Fraser River in Langley, B.C. We would love to see your corner of the country, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you this weekend. Have a great night.